Hi, everyone. We're just going to give it a couple of minutes for uh, everyone to come into the room and, and we'll get started about uh, two minutes after. All right, everyone. Well, we will get started and let folks continue to join us as they come into the room. Uh, welcome. I'm Tom Walker. I'm the executive director here at Encore Outpatient Services. We are a PHP and IOP treating substance use disorder. Um, we are owned in a partnership between Care and Treatment Centers and Maryland Addiction Recovery Center. Um, all three of us are, are sponsors of this event and, and we hope you enjoy it. Um, this webinar series is done weekly. It is titled DMV Neighbors in Treatment and Recovery, a spotlight on local resources, programs, and expertise. Every week, we look forward to highlighting a different provider in the DMV region to provide you with some insights and resources you can utilize in your practice to help you adapt to the changes we've all had to adjust in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic, um, and to provide some general education and knowledge of resources around us. Please note that these sessions are not eligible for continuing education credit. We will be conducting these sessions in a webinar format. All participant microphones will be muted. During the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature to ask any questions you may have. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. Now, I would like to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Jan Beauregard. Dr. Beauregard is a specialist in addictive disorders and trauma. She is the clinical director of the Integrative Psychotherapy Institute in Fairfax, Virginia, where her outpatient practice serves adolescents, adults, and couples. Dr. Beauregard is certified in sensory motor psychotherapy, sex addiction, and imago couples therapy. She is also an EMDR certified consultant and provides supervision to those seeking EMDR certification, including Encore clinicians. Dr. Beauregard is a national workshop presenter and educator. She was the recipient of the ISSTD Fellowship Award, the Karen Addiction Therapist of the Year Award, and was also named top therapist in both addiction and PTSD by Washingtonian Magazine. Today's topic, working with toxic shame and self-loathing in exper experiential approach. Please, let's welcome Dr. Jan Beauregard. Jan, the floor is all yours. Hi, um, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you, Tom, for that wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, today's topic um, is working with toxic shame. And when we consider that many of us here today um, work with addictions, I've always been told that addictions do to shame what salt water does to thirst. So I think shame is an experience um, that is felt by pretty much everyone. And I think often we tend not to address it early on and it may be one one of the things that we need to be more mindful of addressing at the beginning of therapy because it so much contributes to escalation of anxiety depression and ptsd so there have been many studies that say if you work on shame reduction people can be more mindful they'll be less depressed and their symptoms of overall uh, PTSD um, will disintegrate. So for that reason, um, I, I wanted to um, kind of bring it out in the open today and um, give you some strategies and um, you know, help with uh, uh, you learning how to work with this emotion. So we can go to the, the next slide. Um, we're going to have some experiential uh, type activities to the best of our ability on a webinar. Usually this would be in um, uh, workshop format, but I will do my best to communicate a few directions. And these are optional, of course, but I hope everyone will participate and there'll be no grades or tests at the end. And there'll be time for questions as well. Next slide.
Hey, I think starting with um, a definition, um, shame is really an intense, overwhelming affect, and it's associated with the autonomic nervous system. And those familiar with the window of tolerance model, you know, typically um, shame will be something we either avoid or try to um, ignore. And it can often, you know, lead to freeze, sometimes fight, sometimes fight. Um, and so it can take you out of that window of tolerance and, um, you know, make you less mindful um, for, you know, attachment related interaction. So, you know, in some of the, the people that talk about shame, they say that the affect is one of inferiority, seeing oneself in a negative light, um, and actually feeling like you're disintegrating when you're in relationship with a dysregulating other. So that could be in, the, in a relationship, you know, parent-child dyad, it could be in a coupleship, it could be a boss and a, an employee. Um, we see it in, in, you know, it's kind of a relational um, affect. And so it's important to, um, you know, address, you know, where some of those um, early experiences were um, where shame was kind of um, installed um, in the neurobiology of the clients that we're working with. So I wanted to um, begin with one little um, experiential activity. And I, I know if you're home, you might have something you're writing a few notes on. So I'd like you just to take a small um, you know, sheet of paper or you know, post-it note, whatever you have available to you. And what I would like everyone to do is I just like you to write down, doesn't have to be the worst shameful experience. In fact, if I did this with a client or in a workshop, I would say, keep your level of distress, you know, a five or under on a 10 point scale, but just one small example of something you're ashamed of. And I'd like you just to write it out and then fold up that piece of paper and we'll give you about, you know, 30 seconds, 45 seconds to complete that. So as you're, you know, noting what you wrote down on your piece of paper, if I were doing this in a group or with a client, you know, I wouldn't, you know, necessarily look at it. I just say, as you, you know, as you notice this shameful experience that you wrote about just now, what's the worst part of it for you? Do you get an image? Do you get a body sensation? Is there strong emotion? Or is there some kind of negative belief that you have about yourself? And just kind of note what that is. And as you're sitting with this shame content on this piece of paper and you're, you're knowing it's there in front of you, just kind of let that land in your body and notice how does your particular physiology carry the knowledge that this shameful thing is a part of your life experience? Do you feel any kind of tingliness or heaviness? Notice your posture. Notice how you hold your head and your shoulders. And if I were in a group, I would ask you to take that shame experience, fold it up, and I would have you put it in an envelope, and I might have you write the word shame on it. And then I'd have you maybe pair up with another person, and I'd ask you first, what would it be like to hold the shame envelope on your heart? What are the feelings that come up? And then as you take it away, what would it be like to take that shame envelope and hold it out to another person? They're not gonna take it, but just the act of reaching your hand forward as if they're going to take that envelope from you. What would it be like if they took that envelope and they folded it up and they put it in their purse or their wallet? What would you notice in your body then? What would it be like if you could take that shame experience back and just sit on it? Just put it under your torso and, and sit on it. Or take it and put it behind you. 
So all the things that we do here are showing how we organize our experience around how close or far or how relational we are with our shame experience. So there are many, many things you could do with this little activity with shame. One of the other things we typically do after we have a discussion and talk about it is we have some kind of a ritual so that we could get rid of the shame experience. So I ask people to imagine, you know, what would they like to do to kind of get this out of the body, um, help release it. And I let the clients come up with ideas. And then we talk about, you know, other things that we might do that are more ritualistic. You know, we could have like a burning bowl ceremony. We might go outside and they could release the shame into the fire and ask for some kind of a, you know, positive affirmation so that they're not carrying it as easily. Um, we could bury it. I've had clients say they took it down to the river and they put it on a little boat that they made and they let it, you know, sail out down the river. So I think the importance of ritual um, could be brought in here um, for something like this. The last thing that I usually do is I have them take, you know, the shame um, envelope and as they're sitting with it in a workshop or in a group experience, I have them make eye contact all around the circle or in the room. And I ask them, what is it like to know that every single person in this room, in this workshop, in this seminar has an envelope and they have shame in it? And somehow that universal you know, knowledge that it's not unique and that we're not the only ones that have it, it feels a little less heavy, a little less damaging. So these are just some things you can do with that one little experiential. I'd like to look at the next slide. All right, this next slide um, is important because I think we need to understand that shame is something that is very related to development and it's embedded in the attachment system. And they believe that shame first comes online between 18 months and three years. And it's usually in response to a perceived rejection or when it interferes with some kind of positive affect. In other words, you have a toddler and they're you know, walking over to a table and they go to grab you know, a china piece off the table and the parents go, no, don't do that. And so they immediately can go into this shame response because the attachment's been broken. They see the look on the parent's face. So it's whenever interest, excitement, or enjoyment, joy get interrupted. So it becomes like an action system. Then the body will go into shame. And we're gonna talk about the different ways that that can manifest itself in the body. Um, this photograph is actually from my backyard. Um, one of the benefits of quarantine was that um, we had a hawk, um, a pair of hawks um, lay three eggs and they hatched these little triplets. And in looking at them, you know, I'm kind of noticing, you know, their attachment system and how the mother hawk will scold them, you know, if one of them, you know, takes the entire worm and they don't share. And um, you can see them, you know, flutter their feathers and they know that they've been scorned a little bit. And, you know, I think often when people talk about shame, they think of it as always, always bad and always negative. And maybe just a hint of shame was an evolutionary thing that we needed for survival or protection. It was a way to maintain some kind of social order. It was a way to stay a part of the group. And it may have helped people, animals survive in some way by having that mechanism. Otherwise, you wonder why it would be you know, embedded in our attachment system. So I think it could be both um, you know, maybe a little bit you know, biological as well as, you know, learned um, response when we don't have the kind of attachment system, you know, that we all want. Uh, next slide, please. If you had a Petri dish and you wanted to grow shame, you would add these three things. You'd keep everything secret, you'd be really silent about it, or you'd have a real strong internal critic that would be very, very judging. 
Now, I want you to think about most of the clients that we see that have an addiction, whether it be substance abuse, sex addiction, an eating disorder, gambling. There's a whole lot of secrecy. They're silent about it a long time, hoping it'll go away or magically disappear. And they always have a difficult time, you know, with judgment, you know, self-judgment and um, self-loathing often too. So those are the three ingredients. Now, if you wanted to try to disintegrate or reduce shame, what you're going to try to do is put empathy and compassion in because it's really hard for shame to survive when you do that. Now, it's easy to say that, but sometimes there's a real nourishment, I call it a nourishment barrier, when you try to help a, a client you know, embody some kind of self-compassion or some kind of empathy for self, you can meet a lot of resistance or what I call a nourishment barrier. And it's almost as if that you know, fight to survive, um, to not have needs, you know, again, coming out of the attachment system, prevents them from embodying you know, some self-love, some compassion. So that has to be taught and has to be taught in you know, real simple ways, I think, at the beginning. So I'm gonna talk about how you might work with that um, a little bit later on. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, shame in the body. Part of um, the work that I have done uh, for quite a while now involves, um, you know, body-based treatment with sensory motor psychotherapy, and um, shame is a topic, you know, that's discussed in some detail. And we're taught as clinicians to really pay attention the moment our clients really walk in the room, and how they hold their their body, their posture, um, their chest, whether they have that, you know, stooped, you know, posture. Uh, sagging chest, they look small or pulled in. Um, and then as we're talking and, and we do our intake and we're listening to part of the narrative, you know, do they make eye contact? Are they blushing a little bit? Is there some kind of flush? Are they moved to tears? And I didn't, you know, put dissociation here, but I, I it could have also said that, you know, part of a shame response too is that they so much want to avoid it, they don't make contact with it. Um, sometimes clients can't even bear the word shame. So rather than starting there, sometimes I will say, um, seems like there's some embarrassment, huh? You know, just to get them a little warmed up to the idea or, you know, it feels like, um, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, contempt for self. So the word shame can be almost intolerable with some clients. So you have to kind of work around it a little bit. I do think there are some people that are actually, um, you know, have this kind of shame proneness when they suffer with um, self-esteem, you know, problems, they're going to be much more prone to shame. And we've seen it a lot with social anxiety uh, clients that they're going to be prone to shame. And there are times in the life cycle of a human being when the shame is, um, the most intense, and it would be two different times. One during adolescence, when so many things are changing in the body, in their social world, um, puberty, all of that. Um, and again, when um, people become elderly, because you're, you, you're losing some of your um, physicality from youth. Um, most people have retired by that time, so your sense of mission and purpose is no longer the same. So those are the two age groups that we need to be, you know, more sensitive to in terms of carrying a lot of embodied shame. Um, so I look for those signs and symptoms. And again, um, if you're working with, you know, complex trauma, and most of our addiction clients are dual diagnosis, um, shame can be kind of contagious. And when they're in relationships, either with uh, family members or maybe some of their love uh, relationships, and you have domination, submission, humiliation, degradation, any of those things, then those clients are gonna be experiencing more shame because they've been victimized in some way. Uh, so that shame has a, um, you know, a positive impact in some ways because it keeps the person kind of they see it as a signal to keep out of danger so they might hide flee collapse shut down but in a family where 
their needs can't be met, that's actually a survival strategy. And our job, you know, with our clients, you know, when we work with them is to help them understand that their younger selves may have needed, you know, to shut down or submit or collapse, but that that's not going to be a very effective strategy as they move into the world and um, try to, you know, maintain sobriety. And, um, and the last part of sobriety is always about, you know, relationships, how, how are they going to have better relationships in the world? So um, there's a huge link to, you know, the types of trauma people have had and, and the shame that they carry. Okay, next slide. I tend to use um, different modalities when I'm, when I'm working with shame and, you know, there are different art activities that you can use. And you could have used that with the envelope activity I did a few moments ago um, as an extension. Um, you can find these little um, diagrams of the body easily on the internet. If you just Google, you know, body diagrams, um, you'll find both male, female forms of body diagrams. And um, just to get one, print it out and have it for clients. And if you're doing an activity or you start to sense some somatic um, information coming online, it might be good just to get that body diagram and have them tell you what's happening in the body. If they're a client with a lot of complex trauma, sometimes you'll learn a lot from this body diagram because they'll you know, sketch something out, but they may not even have recall of why, you know, why would you know, this part of the body be having a reaction right now? So it kind of gives you some clues um, about things that you know, they might not totally remember or you're developing body awareness. And, some clients, they come in and, you know, they're cognitive and they're, everything is above the head and they don't even know they have a body. So I think, you know, trying to get them to do, um, you know, small activities sometimes that are a little more body-based can kind of stretch that capacity, um, make them more mindful and more aware. Okay, the next slide. We're going to spend a bit of time on the shame compass because I think, you know, when you are thinking about, you know, shame, and you could do this in a number of ways, you could actually do a, a shame genogram and you could look at, you know, the different um, behaviors of someone that has intense shame. And it could be everything from rage to suicidality, it could be depression, um, it could be self harm, uh, addiction, you know, behaviors. But I like to use this compass because it gives us a way of, um, you know, thinking about our clients a little differently because shame doesn't look like just one thing. And I think the more you learn about the different types of presentations, the more you're going to start recognizing it um, in your client. And then based on the style that they have of managing their shame, then you're going to know what to remedy or what to heal. So the shame compass is um, Nathanson. Um, comes from a book called Shame and Pride. And um, one type of um, response to having intense shame is withdrawal. So this might be the client that um, is a real loner. Um, they're not real talkative. You know, they're pretty silent. We would call them introverted. Um, you know, the kind of, they would be like shorn from the herd, you know, kind of the loner person. They don't really fit in. Sometimes there, you know, we see a lot of despair in a client like this, and they often um, can get lulled into addictions from this intense uh, disconnection and loneliness. So they're going to be the, the kids that, or the adults that get involved in a lot of video gaming, um, you know, marathon Netflix. Um, they could even be workaholics, uh, drugs, alcohol, um, and have often, you know, depression as one of their other co-occurring disorders. Another form of shame is when they um, start to really attack themselves. They're almost masochistic in, in their put downs. And, um, you know, their statements are going to be things like, I suck at everything. I'm a loser. Um, no one could ever love me. Um, I'm really disgusting. Lots of name calling, feeling inferior. And again, they're in despair and um, pretty deflated. At the extreme end, we have masochism where they um, you know, can be really self-abusive, suicidal, they wanna die. 
um, they can engage in self-harm, um, anorexia, other eating disorders. So that's another presentation of having acute shame. Um, another style is when someone is so intolerant of feeling it that if they even get close to it, they go into fight. You know, it's again, a limbic system response and they will take a one-up position, try to really bolster their self-image. They won't accept, you know, any kind of cr criticism, even if it's constructive. And um, they will verbally or physically, you know, attack, humiliate people, criticize. Um, they can be very rageful. Sometimes it's dissociative, sometimes it's conscious. Um, these clients can be difficult in groups um, because we know in groups that we often try, you know, in the group process to not, um, to have, you know, clients try to be helpful to one another. And if you have someone that has so much shame, but their modality is attack, um, they can be difficult um, to manage in a group because they're so sensitive. So they might, you know, need a little more one-on-one -on -one, um, and you have to go really slow, you know, with that type of client. And then the, um, the last style would be more the um, denial. They don't even accept that they, they really have shame. So they try to neutralize it. They pretend, you know, they don't really have it. It's kind of outside their consciousness. So if, you know, you talk about one thing and you start getting close and you say, well, that must have, you know, really been embarrassing, they'll change subjects and they'll say, well, you know, I, I'm really popular at my church, or I, I really do a lot of good stuff here. So they really um, know how to, they're like the masters of deflection. So that's a that's another style. And again, you know, their their addictions are going to be to um, not get close to that unpleasant affect. If I have five beers, I'm totally shameless. I can do what I want. Now, at the extreme end of that would be narcissism. And as we know, they're above the shame, and um, that's going to take um, you know a long time. Um, to kind of whittle that down in, in very, very small doses with a lot of compassion if you're gonna work with someone that has a lot of narcissism. Um, shame is something that really just sticks like glue. And oftentimes when you're encountering it in your, your clients, it's always good um, to try to figure out, you know, whatever their life experience is presenting right now that's causing them shame you know, to try to um, do a little exploration, whether you do EMDR or sensory motor or um, internal family systems, to try to link that back to some of the early childhood experiences that may have, um, you know, felt very similar. I use an expression sometimes, I say, you know, if I'm feeling hysterical inside, it was probably historical. So I always try to go to the root and try to do the repair, you know, with the child parts um, because you're going to have a, a whole lot easier time coping with, you know, today's shame and trauma if they understand where it came from. Um, so it's not just a body-based response. They, you know, they do make meaning of it, um, and it gets reinforced by other other traumas. Um, and if so, if they grow up in a family where they couldn't have a voice and they couldn't have needs, and then they're in a relationship like that, or they're in a job like that it just gets you know, more and more reinforced. So I wanted to move back to, um, again, another activity that you might do because we've been talking about the body a little bit. And um, sometimes you, know, you can do um, some work with the body by just simply um, doing a little mindfulness to get people you know, fully present with a little bit of breath work. And then again, have them bring up something that's shameful and you can ask what the body, you know, feels like it wants to do. You know, does it want to curl up or pull in? Does it want to turn away? Does it want to collapse? And then if you wanted to do some resourcing, once you know how shame lands in the body, you could ask them to do some, what Pat Ogden calls an experiment. And you could say, well, rate the shame, you know, on a zero to 10, how strong does it feel? And then what you could ask the client to do is what happens when and then you could have them change their body posture by doing a series of opposite movements so if they they tend to have their head down they could just lift their head up if their shoulders are pulled forward you could have them pull their shoulders back if um, they don't take up much space you could just ask them to stretch their arms out 
So you play around with those movements and what you're really trying to teach them is some grounding and uh, resource movements that they could do on their own when they have what you know we might call a shame attack or you know a moment of shame. And um, so you let them take time so that they can reframe you know that shame state as an adapted part of themselves and then see that they can, you know, with a little bit of movement and compassion and maybe some affirmations, they can get themselves out of it. And when they're mindful, they can kind of um, go into a thought process where they, because sometimes when they're in shame, every fiber of their being feels like it's in shame. So I have them move from it's all of me to what I call, you know, a part of me. So if you say, you know, I am shameful, and then you have the client say, a part of me feels shameful. And then the third one is, I am noticing that a part of me feels shameful. Usually the intensity of that is going to decrease because they now have that observing ego and they're able to kind of see the totality um, you know, they're more than just their shame. So I like to do, you know, work like that, um, you know, with the body and with this observing, you know, higher self. Um, Richard Schwartz uses that term. You could call it wise self. We all have different names depending on what, you know, our training and our orientation is. So I think that can be um, another helpful activity to, you know, work with this compass of shame. Um, I have um, another um, activity that I do um, that I call the web of shame. And in my office, I have a wardrobe uh, cabinet that I put all my supplies and things in. And um, on the back of the inside door, I have a sheet of white paper that I keep there. And um, I have clients work on an activity. Sometimes I've done this in groups and sometimes I've just done it individually where they could take it home. Sometimes even in my office with art supplies, I'll have them, if we have the time, um, do it in the, um, in the office, but I call it the web of shame. So just like um, with the activity with the um, piece of paper, um, putting it in the envelope, you could have them bring up um, an experience or a time they felt some shame and have them, um, you know, look over the details, how old they were, what their felt experience was, the negative beliefs, the emotions. And then you could give them a post-it note and have them either, you know, draw a picture, an image that represents it, or maybe they're thinking of one word or anything. And they don't have to be artists. It could be stick figures. It could be just words. It could be anything. And then I have them take a piece of construction paper and some yarn and they um, take their post-it where they've written this shame construct, whatever it is that they're gonna use to represent it. And then they make a web. And I'm gonna ask um, Caitlin to let me hold this up because I'll show you what I've done here and hopefully we can see it. And I know you can't read it from where you're all sitting, but basically it's the yarn um, on a piece of paper. And then, you know, one person wrote dirty with a bunch of lines and this person is like keeled over with their head down, you know, kind of embodied in shame. And this person says, I never had a voice. I was totally X'd out. And this one wrote, I'm fat and ugly. So, you know, you can have whatever they put and you can put it on this web of shame. It's a nice group activity, but the way I've done it, like I said, is um, just to um, put their particular thing on my closet web of shame that I have. And then when it gets full, I toss it out and I start it all over again. Um, and we just rebuild another one with new people. But um, I, I think these things kind of um, take it out and make it you know, just an aspect of who they are um, rather than all of who they are. Now, when you're doing, you know, a shame experience, I think it's always good to start out um, with, you know, their strengths and their resources um, and then move into the shame activity. So a resource memory would be to think about a time when they felt really competent and capable, any experience where they've had any kind of pride. So as they're telling me about that experience, that they recall, again, I'm in a sensory motor way, I'm watching for any kind of action tendency that I see 
or um, facial expression or posture change, I get them to tell me a little more detail just so that I can see how it lands in the body. And then I will say, you know, I'm noticing, you know, when you share that experience that you're smiling, you know, your face lights up. And, um, and sometimes they're not even aware of the changes, you know, the shifts that can happen. And then um, once I get the gestalt of that positive experience and I talk about, you know, ask them about emotions and feelings and where it lands in the body, if you do EMDR, you could actually install that feeling of pride and confidence in the body using slow sets of EMDR. And um, so that could be like the platform before you even, you know, talk about some of the shame-based um, memories or, or experiences they've had. So those are just some of the things. You can go back to the PowerPoint. All right, we can go to the next slide. Okay, this was, um, again, another example of a positive um, installation. Um, and this would be more like um, EMDR. Um, so I just gave, you know, a little bit of the direction there. It, it's what I just talked about, you know, vignette of, you know, strength, um, pride, ability, savoring it, um, luxuriating in that. And sometimes they can't do a lot of positive affect either. So what my experience has been when they can't really take it in, again, that nourishment barrier, um, is I tell them that I want to titrate the dose. I want to make it a little bit smaller. So I ask them, you know, if they can't do it the first time, I say, well, suppose I ask you just to feel a drop of pride. Suppose I just ask you to feel one molecule or one atom. Usually they can do that if you, you know, really size it down. And um, so that can get past that nourishment barrier or that inner critic. Um, another thing that you can do um, is you could have a mask making kind of activity where the clients could um, use materials either in an art class or at home and they could um, do an activity where they have a mask of the part of themselves that they show to the outside world. And um, so that's the face that we wear. And then they might um, have a mask that shows real authentic pride. And that could come off of the former activity that you did um, of a prideful experience. And then they might have a third one, which is something that's representative of their shame. And again, we're doing parts work all along here as we do these art activities or these experientials, because then they can um, you know, share them with the group and they might talk about how those two aspects could um, talk to each other, you know, and kind of be supportive if they had, you know, the shame mask kind of came up and took over, or what I call getting hijacked, um, you know, by a younger child part or a dissociative part. And then thinking about, you know, how else could they resource themselves. And often I will also have them, um, you know, bring up if they've had any people um, in their life, whether it's been a family member, a grandparent, um, a teacher, coach, anyone in their life that um, has been someone that has valued them, and they can bring that in as another, you know, kind of self-reflective, um, you know, positive affect, and you could install some of that um, with EMDR. So those are, you know, again, you know, some of the things that I like to do. Um, and as far as like, um, you know, guilt and shame, I think it's important to distinguish um, between the two. I think, you know, if someone's really in shame, um, their negative cognitions and beliefs are going to be um, pretty extreme. You know, I'm worthless. I'm a bad person. Um, if they're guilty, they just are really unhappy about the behavior, but they they don't kind of drop into, um, you know, a lot of negative um, self-criticism. So I think it's important, you know, also to make, you know, the distinction um, between those two things when we're working, you know, with shame. Um, there's another activity called a shame genogram, and you can basically draw a circle on a piece of paper and write the word shame in it. And then um, the genogram talks about you know, ways um, that you express yourself because of the shame that you feel. And so sometimes I give them, you know, examples. I'll talk about um, perfectionism or control 
because those are things you know that um, are fairly common in um, in some of the people that we treat um, or depression, procrastination, some of the addictions, and then I'll have them you know give examples in this shame genogram of um, who else in the family might have had some of those same you know behaviors? Where did you learn it from? What were the messages? Um, to what degree you know in your life today? Do you still use perfectionism? Do you still use rage? Do you still use victimization? And how, if you worked with this embodied shame, um, you might be able to um, reduce the you know the action tendency to do some of these other you know harmful behaviors? So that's another. Um, quick activity um, that you could do um, to help reduce the shame. So um, we can move to the next slide. Okay, I, um, I love the outdoors. Um, I've always been um, you know, a real nature nut. And I, I love when I moved to Washington, you know, the cherry trees were always something that I thought in the dogwoods, you know, really spectacular around here. And one of the things with teenagers, I don't work with teens as much as I used to, but I spent um, the first half of my career working mostly with adolescents because my first career was a high school teacher. So one naturally drifted to the other. And the kids that were really shame prone, they always had just such collapsed posture and so concave and um, you, know, you could see it in their physicality. So one of the things that I tried to get them to do was to go adopt a tree and to be more like a tree. I wanted them to have tree-like behavior. And I would use all these analogies and I talk about, you know, a tree having really deep roots so that if something bad happened, you know, the wind could blow through the tree. And I talked about if you stand against a tree, we're gonna help you with this posture. So I want you to do some daily practice once you adopt a tree somewhere of standing against that tree like a proud tree, you know, a big strong oak. So I would give them all this practice, you know, around choosing a tree and um, and then paying attention because I'm teaching them mindfulness at the same time about how their tree changes over time. So we can go to the next slide. And in the fall one year, I had a student um, go off to college and she said to me in you know, one of her last sessions, she said, I don't know what I'm gonna do because my tree's in Northern Virginia, you know, and I'm going to school. So she was going to school in Williamsburg and I said, I bet you could find another tree. So this was the tree that she found in the fall and she sent me a picture of it. I thought it was just beautiful, that fall um, image. We can go back to that one. And, um, and so, you know, trees are everywhere. Now, I travel out in the Southwest quite a bit because I love that area of the country. And, you know, trees are a little more sparse. So, you know, maybe you'd want to use something different. Um, but even, you know, in the mountains of, um, you know, northern New Mexico, I was able to find some interesting trees. So let's just look at the next image. Next slide. Okay. Whoops. One, one further back. Good. Okay, that is a um, bristle cone. Okay. One slide back, please. Note forward. I'm looking for the tree with the winter image. That's good, right there. Um, this is a bristlecone prine, and they grow in um, mountainous regions in the southwest. And um, even a tree like this, you know, if you were going to try to um, embody that, you can see that it's weathered some pretty fierce, you know, weather. And um, it had to sometimes bend and twist in order to be flexible. So there are a lot of things that I do with shame and trees and embodying resources. And um, this young lady that went away to college, um, she um, did a lot of self-harm, a lot of cutting behavior. And when she finally left in the fall, she gave me her last package of razor blades and knives. And I still have them in my desk drawer. It's been like 10 years since I've seen this woman. Um, and what she did was sent me a um, postcard, probably, I don't know, eight or nine years after I'd seen her, she was um, a gay woman and she had met someone and she got married. And she said, I wanna show you the wedding ring I picked out. So I'd like you to look at the next image. 
So sometimes, you know, we don't think what we say really matters to kids, you know, to adolescents that it's really trivial. And, um, you know, when she sent me that, I was, I just couldn't believe it, you know, that she picked the tree. And um, so she uses that image as her grounding tool um, in life. And so I think when we can find things from nature and um, symbolism that are, you know, that's out in the world, you know, animals, um, things that are always there, you know, even in a pandemic, you know, we have nature. Um, and I think right now those resources can be very, very important for people. Um, I know we're going to have questions. Um, I have one last little thing I want to talk about so we can go to the next slide. I already did this, the web of shame, so we can skip to the next one. Um, moving in space, if we were doing um, a, a workshop, again, what you can do in a group activity is you could have them, you know, start out with something positive, like walking around feeling a sense of um, strength or a sense of pride or a sense of competence. And you could have them look at others and look at themselves and look at how they, you know, they carry themselves in their body. And then you could do that same um, experience. You have them stop and then they stand in space and you could have, bring up a, have them bring up a shameful experience and get, you know, kind of key into the core organizers around that, the emotion, um, the sensations they're feeling, how their posture is. And then they could walk around again and just kind of observe the group. And at the end, you do one last one that was on resources again. So it, it's just sort of like they can have a sense that shame is not just a thought or an idea, but it really is embedded in the physiology and that they can do things to kind of shake it off. Okay, next slide. I can't do any workshop without talking um, a little bit about the benefits of yoga um, to work with trauma and also, you know, um, shame that's held in the body. Uh, so, you know, one of the things, even if you don't want to call it yoga because, you know, you're not a yoga teacher, um, and you know just a little bit is you can call it movement and you can say, I'd like to start to teach you, um, you know, some movements that I think are gonna help you kind of digest some of this overwhelming shame or help you push against it or work against it. So I might teach them um, simple, you know, postures, um, you know, warrior poses, um, poses where they're just, you know, reaching up, you know, hands in a V, kind of like a victory pose. And, um, you know, have them have that as part of their somatic, what I call their somatic toolkit um, that allows them to, um, you know, embody a, a healthier state. So we have, um, we can go to the next stop, next slide. Because, you know, yoga, again, um, Bessel van der Kolk in the clinic in Boston, um, did a whole um, you know, research study on yoga in the body and um, found that you know, people with acute PTSD um, would have less symptoms you know, with 10, 10 yoga sessions. That, and I, I'm thinking more of trauma-sensitive yoga, um, which is, um, uh, I could talk about that for 10 minutes, but uh, trauma-sensitive yoga is a little bit uh, less directive and it's more gives people, you know, permission about how they want to move. And um, usually the instructors are going to be sensitive about, you know, moving a client or touching a client, you know, without permission. Um, so I, I, I think all of these things, whether it's um, internal family system, sensory motor, EMDR, uh, trauma-based yoga, um, all of these things can help us um, with shame and uh, disintegrate shame. And I wanted to um, end the workshop um, with one last thing. And I want everybody to think about, you know, the shameful thing you wrote on your piece of paper, you know, early on. And if we wanted to, you know, like um, have a, an imagery where we kind of ripped it up or we burned it in a fire or buried it, um, maybe we could take some, you know, kind of positive affirmation, you know, and leave here. And um, we've been sitting the whole, you know, almost a whole hour. So I wanted to end with, um, you know, a ritual I might do, you know, in a workshop. And we're going to together um, use an affirmation. You could use your own, um, but the one I'm going to use is I embrace the world with vigor and vitality because I think that kind of pushes against a shame state if we can do that. 
And I'm just going to show you this little posture. And it's something I teach the clients, you know, that they can do at home um, when they're feeling like um, a little bit unsettled. So um, if you uh, would take the PowerPoint off and um, turn me back on for a minute. So this particular yoga movement has three simple positions and um, you have them kind of stand straight. You know, you can use your tree metaphor again, you know, shoulders back. They might want to take a couple, you know, grounding breaths and really feel their feet on the floor. And you're going to have them take their arms and really reach around like they were grabbing the planet Earth. You know, that blue, beautiful, swirling image that most of us recognize as planet Earth. And the next posture would be, they're going to be like a tree. So they would bring their arms out. And then the third one is they're gonna reach up for the sky. And the last one is they're gonna bow out with whatever their affirmation is. And the one I picked is I embrace the world with vigor and vitality. And that is the end of our presentation for today. And I'm welcome to take any questions anyone might have. And thank you so much for that. Um, I, I appreciate how resource dense and solution oriented it was as well. And there's a lot to take away from that. Um, I have a question regarding implementing, you know, these tools in your, in your practice during COVID-19 and isolation and, and quarantine. How has that changed things for you? What are you finding effective? Okay. Um, I, uh, prior to COVID, you know, did an awful lot of sensory motor and a lot of EMDR. So um, there was a little bit of panic in the pandemic, you know, um, for me, you know, initially. And, um, but, you know, like I always do, it's sort of, you know, I'm either gonna live in the problem or I'm gonna live in the solution. And immediately I thought about all these EMDR therapists that I know who um, belong to that humanitarian organization called HAP and they're always doing EMDR online you know all over the world you know Africa places where um, people can't get services so um, within a matter the community I think the therapy community in general too responded pretty well with um, all kinds of free workshops and webinars and um, you know Pat Ogden did one um, Dini Laliotis has been doing them for EMDR. Different people have been um, really um, generous with their time uh, to try to bring us up to speed. So I have been doing some of these things remote um, with EMDR using a, you know, um, an audio tech app that I can send online you know, to the client. Or they could do just tapping on their knees. And if you're doing resource installation, they can do the butterfly hug where they're just doing slow taps. So I kind of do a practice with them just so that they get the, you know, the speed and the rhythm correct. And I've been doing online um, EMDR processing. Uh, the latest thing that's happened in the last maybe three weeks is um, a couple new clients that were taking advantage of the pandemic because they, um, they lived, you know, far away in Virginia and there's no way they'd ever drive to my office and they wanted to do like a set of 10 sessions before the pandemic ended. And um, there were people that I felt would be, you know, really appropriate and they didn't have a lot of, um, you know, dissociation, that kind of thing. They were fairly high functioning. And I, um, so I started it with brand new people. Um, you know, people that are um, more fragile you're certainly going to want to do a lot of resource installation type work, whether you're doing parts work or, um, you know, cognitive behavioral act, you know, whatever your modality is, I think before you get to processing and what I've done so that I make myself feel a little more comfortable is I've extended the session. So if I were going to do a 50 minute session, I've made it 80 minutes because I didn't know, you know, when I, transferred to remote how it was going to work and then if i had a client that i thought you know was more unstable i'd put them either at the beginning of the day or the end of the day so that i had a little more latitude um because we all have had to um you know work with our own window of tolerance you know with this pandemic and modify you know some of our tools and techniques 
Um, but I'm finding if I, you know, tell clients ahead of time, hey, you know, the next time you come to the session, have, you know, some um, art paper, a set of markers, some post-it notes, some yarn, they do it. You know, they're used to me kind of working in different ways. So they'll show up um, oftentimes with some of the things they need. Usually they're simple materials they'd have around the house. Um, so those are some changes I've made. And um, I think that's pretty much uh, it. That was great. There was the, the one question, I do believe you covered it in your, in your talk generally, but more specific to how can toxic shame be recognized and addressed in family members? Um, and then we're, yeah. How well, would you yeah, I'm going to assume, you know, especially in our addiction community, um, you can imagine, you know, how parents are going to feel if they've spent, you know, years, um, you know, worrying about, you know, a child possibly, you know, dying due to, a, you know, addiction or um, providing lots of resources and nothing seems to work and some of the self-blame and self-judgment, you know, that might go with that. So I kind of make an assumption right from the get-go that shame is something I'm going to need to address and I, you know, I'm going to need to resource people um, no matter how, you know, how they show up. Um, because if they're too much out of their window of tolerance, they're not going to be able to help their son or daughter either. So I have to get them grounded and start with whatever they've done right and um, try to resource some of that stuff. Um, and then, you know, start looking at their, you know, kind of the, you know, the uh, generational trauma, you know, that might be present so that they can um, accept responsibility for some, but also have some self-compassion uh, for what maybe they didn't learn or didn't get modeled for them as parents as well. And the beauty is that, you know, in working on all this, we can change the legacy for a family. We might, you know, end a cycle of, um, you know, self-harm or a cycle of suicidality or a cycle of, you know, chronic depression, um, if we can make some correction. Thanks, Jan. Um, we're about out of time, you know, Thank you so much for taking what I know is a, a much, you know, longer presentation and condensing it into this full in this format. Um, if anyone on our call is looking for additional information or has a client that would benefit from your services, what is the best way for them to reach you? Okay. Um, well, there are two ways. Um, I have a web page, and um, that web page address is www.ipivirginia dot com and that is Virginia spelled out and I also have um, an email address which is Dr. Jan at ipivirginia.com and um, I can also be reached by phone and that phone number is 703-385-9667 extension one so well, thank you again for coming out and spending spending time with us Jan okay thank you um, join us next week, uh, same day, same time, as we welcome Vanessa Terry from Aperi Nutrition to discuss eating disorders and disordered eating, the effects on the recovery process. Uh, the following week after that, we will host Eric Quinlan from Recovery Care Partner to address the topic, innovative approaches to academic recovery support during COVID-19. Uh, registration is now open for these webinars and all of our additional webinars uh, through mid-July. You can register for those now. In the meantime, um, if you have any questions, if you want to follow up, you're interested in services that we offer, um, please feel free to reach out directly to myself, to Mallory Schwartzman at Maryland Addiction Recovery Center, um, Jess Ayer in Maryland for care and treatment centers and James Flentje in uh, DC and Virginia for care and treatment centers. Thanks again to all of you uh, for taking time and joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day.